Well, I was already ex presented to you, and I've had the great pleasure of talking to a number of you during what has been a very full series of four days, of three days. We also had uh, some work before that. Uh, what you see in front of you is largely members of the advisory committee to the Doherty Institute, which is, of course, the main sponsor of this quite amazing event. And it has been an amazing event, and the organization and the selection of topics and people has been uh, really exemplary, very impressive, uh, and uh, it really is a, a huge pleasure to have been part of that. Now we have the unenviable task of trying to kind of put our arms around that and, and see what we can draw out of those days. It's certainly not going to recite everything or even try and draw all the lessons learned, but let's see what we can do from uh, four interesting minds uh, and people who have sat here for uh, the last few days and taken some copious notes and even taken part in some of the presentations. So immediately to my left uh, is uh, Rob Meany, uh, Robert Meany, uh, Bob Meany, and he's the former chair of Valmont Industries. He's the one that looked absolutely distressed when somebody asked what the life of a, uh, a central pivot was. He looked completely distressed and said, it can be a lot more than 10 years. So <laughs> that was one of my memorable minutes from the conference. And so obviously he has huge expertise in that subject. Immediately to my right is Umalele. She's described in your book as an independent scholar, and she's indeed writing a book on some of her experiences. Uh, but she was for a very long time at the World Bank and is re has really been one of the people who's been a thought leader in trying to put together the whole issue of um, economics, water, agriculture. So we're very glad to have her. Peter Rogers, next to her, is from Harvard, from the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Uh, the water, and he's also on the advisory committee, and Peter, again, is one of the really giant figures in trying to blend together economics, water, pricing, all the things that have been very difficult for our world to put together in the 20th and 21st century, and he's played a stellar role. And Ann Willett is the director of the Strategic Alliance for Food, Fuel, and Water, Nebraska Innovation Campus. I think we better start by saying to Ann, what is that and what are you doing? Well, I have the pleasure to work here at Nebraska Innovation Campus and my work revolves around partnerships. It's around the many talented individuals here at the University of Nebraska and our private partners uh, here at Nebraska Innovation Campus are those that might potentially come and join us here. Very good, okay. Now our ground rules are that there's gonna be no presentations. Nothing will be written down if I can't find a pen, didn't you? <laughs> I have a pen but no paper, so we kind of <laughs> okay. match up well. Good, okay, I'll give you a piece of paper. Well, you, no, I don't you need, need okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> I got up so quickly, I was, pay oh, here we are, I found one. Okay, our ground rules are very simple. We're not going to have any presentations. Uh, we're simply going to have a discussion about things that we heard, things that interested us in particular, how this uh, maybe foretells some trends and some uh, lessons that we can all, you, us, take out into the world. And so we'll do that just by having a conversation back and forth. The panel interventions will be short. If one of them wants to get in immediately after another, please lift up your finger and put a cap on it. And so particularly if you want to contradict something somebody said, that makes it very interesting. So uh, the, otherwise we'll just move the conversation around. But I want to start with the question of, you know, we've had a wonderful rich banquet of presentations, side panels, uh, workshops, poster sessions, all of it. Um, you're a hardened group of water conference attenders here. Did anything surprise you uh, in what you heard or saw in this time? Bob, were there any surprises for you? Um, I'm not sure it's a, it's a surprise, but it's maybe the first time I've, well, I've, I've been at a conference where we went into depth about smallholder, irrigate, about smallholder farming in Africa or wherever. And there was a strong emphasis on the importance of irrigation to help those small holder farmers. I've been to conferences where you sit through a couple of days and 
irrigation is only mentioned a few times in passing. I've read books about irrigation, uh, about smallholder farmers and development, et cetera, in which irrigation is, the word irrigation doesn't even come into it. And uh, here, there's a broad consensus and deep consensus that the starting point for helping uh, smallholder farmers who are already farming, they already know how to farm, is to help them have irrigation that matches up to what they need. And uh, the presentations, uh, especially Martin Fisher's, of course, it's so passionate. It's one of the most um, passionate presentations about irrigation and its importance and what, what good it can do for people by putting money into circulation. So that was, uh, and the work that uh, IDE and uh, Kickstart do with very small farmers, they understand these issues so deeply. I think that helped to wake every, everybody up to good. the fact that we need that. So that was your sort of surprise element. Is this on now? Because they mic me differently. I'm on, okay, good enough. That links to one of my surprises, which was the, uh, the assertion, the realization that Sub-Saharan Africa did have renewable groundwater that could be used to support uh, small-scale farmers. That, that was a surprise to me, I guess, because I'm very accustomed in the, in the African context to boreholes that go dry, and it had never struck me that with good management, uh, these, that there could be a replenishment of the water resource uh, for the, for the, the, to make this a fertile notion that you, what you've just talked about. So, Uma, surprises? Were you, any, were you? you're a hard um, lady to surprise. Surprise, yes. It's, um, actually, since I've worked on Africa for many years and seen the problems of irrigation, I, and I come from parts of the world, I come from South Asia and have been looking at issues of water management there. Uh, I am a little less uh, enamored by just the issue of irrigation alone without looking at issues of water management more generally. And what made a tremendous impact on me was the, the first day's discussion we had in the advisory committee about the work on drought management in MENA and how nicely it is being done uh, through collaboration between the university and, and the people in the region, FAO, etc., where each institution is using its comparative advantage to address questions which are going to be very important in the future. So I think in my mind, in the last two or three days, I've been connecting the dots on drought and water management. So the first one was the, the MENA uh, discussion we had, uh, which I thought was a very good example. The second was the, the movie on drought, which made a big impact on me, although I knew about it, I'd been reading about it in New York Times, I didn't really know how severe the problems were. But then it raised so many questions in my mind about how are they dealing with these issues in terms of policies, institutions, technologies, etc. So the next day, I was very pleased to see Pat Mulraw's discussion on water management. And I felt that that's the kind of a, an example of public-private partnerships uh, at a very large level, at, at the level of water basins, et cetera, from which the world has really a lot to learn uh, in terms of mega topics uh, of water management that we are going to face in the world. Uh, and so I can come up with a large number of papers that could be written potentially to combine practical knowledge uh, in how negotiations are done, the role of interstate governments and federal government, et cetera, from which we can learn a lot in Asia. So I can go on, but, but I but think drought management, water management, and looking at productivity in the context of water management in the largest, larger sense of the term is So your surprise what, element what was the contradistinction of, of how starkly presented the drought was in the film. Right. And uh, sort of wondering where is the policy, where is the what's happening, exactly. and then having and having Pat done? talk about some of the very sophisticated and interesting uh, right. elements that are taking place. Good, thanks. That opens up that box. Peter, what were what were you surprised about? Well, I was surprised about the fact that I was here on the first conference, and how much this has developed since then. It's just fantastic mm -hmm. to see the development of the Food Institute and the enthusiasm and the scope of the 
papers that were presented is truly surprising. You know, that we, we take the very small steps where I come from in, on the East Coast. Um, the, what else surprised me was the um, small-scale irrigation. And I, I think that we got some very interesting and enthusiastic um, presentations of that, but it, t it seems to me that uh, there are lots of things missing on that. Small tends to be small. You know, the usual thing, small is beautiful. But small is also small. And it's hard for a small farmer to, if it's a one hectare of land, even if he gets irrigation, what to do with how, how, to, how can they move up the, away from poverty, get, get away from subsistence farming. And you do that by becoming a commercial or a business farmer. But you can't do that unless you have a food chain system, supply system. And we had very little on that. And there's no, obviously, if you get uh, irrigation, you should diversify. But there's no point in diversifying if you can't get rid of the stuff you're growing. And I think that was a surprise to me that we had a lot of enthusiasm for getting the irrigation in, but we didn't hear very much about getting the, the diversified crops out of the system. So. Yeah, it's quite uh, interesting that the only person who talked about that was Jane Irrigation, and they said yeah, that they had had to set up systems within Jane to buy the crop yeah. from the farmer if the farmer was going to do, just as you said, be able to buy the irrigation. Or, yeah. The other, the other thing, the surprising thing, is that from the movie, uh, you know, there's an old saying, Mother Nature knows best. And uh, the idea that you build a city with 15 million people in the middle of a desert in <laughs> California is something that does give us some pause to think mm -hmm. about what we, were, what we were thinking about. And not only what we were thinking about in then, but what are we thinking about right now? Because look at the suburban, I remember in the movie yesterday, or the other evening, the huge suburban development still taking place in California. California yep. is still the golden place for people to migrate to and to demand a, a standard of living which is typically not obtainable in a desert. So that was my, some of my Quite right. Anne, what surprised you? You've been a busy lady because you've had to be in and out doing your day job as well, but uh, any surprises you want to bring up? Well, I'm not surprised, but I'm amazed and grateful at the number of people who have dedicated their lives and the diversity in the fields of study mm. around this issue. And, um, you know, year after year, people come with new ideas and fresh ideas and the dedication to try to make a change. And I just think that's so inspiring. And I also took a few things away from Jeff Rakes, um, his opening comments, where he really challenged that ideas moving forward need to be transformative. And um, also he talked about the need to innovate faster than we are now so we don't fall behind, as Dr. Kasman also talked about just a little bit ago. And I think that is really very important that we can innovate, but we have to encourage ourselves and the next generation to think even bigger and think further down the line and figure out a way to innovate faster and in a different way. Good. The other surprise I had was the how he, particularly the young people that were at the entrepre, entrepreneurs group, could take pieces of data and spaces in information management and turn these into products that they could actually put on the market. I was, I was absolutely bouleversé, really, really bowled over. And you had one of the examples here in the Good Earth uh, presentation that you saw. And uh, it, it was really fascinating how they've taken, it's like taking snips of a genome, but they were taking snips of information and saying, ah, you could turn that into a market because that information is hard for people to get unless they know how to aggregate it. I can aggregate it, I can sell that or sell the services associated with it. So that was another one of my nice surprises. So I wanted to bring that up. Okay, let's move on to another question, another area. Um, one of the kinds of conferences that annoy me enormously is full of talking heads that go, governments should, state level should, professors should, farmers should, and uh, it, it's a whole catalog of how everybody should behave and then it would be a wonderful world. Uh, and there's very little snakes or ladders connecting the should that should be done with how do you actually get this done in the various circumstances that exist. And we've had how you get these things done in Nebraska and how you maybe get them done uh, in the global south. But uh, panel members, are, are we making progress in moving away from should, 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 should to here's, 
here's how you uh, actually get something done. And I'm not going to go up and down the same time every time, but I'll still start with you again, Bob. Are we making progress? I think so. Well, I, there, there are so many things I heard at the conference that are things that a university, either University of Nebraska or another one, can look into, can build projects around and build um, uh, knowledge around. I have to believe that there, and, and there are things related to the things I'm interested in which are more or less business related. One of the things that I've been uh, confronted with in, recent, in the last couple years working on this uh, uh, shared center pivot project in Africa is um, groundwater and the availability of groundwater. And just what does that mean? Because there are a lot of uh, maps of Africa groundwater. And yeah. you see them, they, have, they come from different sources in Germany and the US, et cetera. But uh, I've been confronted with the fact that nobody really knows in Tanzania, in any one county, very much about the groundwater. And um, you stumble upon, actually, I've been told by people in Europe, well, groundwater in Tanzania, good luck. And then on my last trip to Tanzania, I was in a valley that was about 60 miles long and 25 miles wide that's sitting on an aquifer with artesian pressure that actually makes it hard to drill a well. And so I realized that there's a shortage of knowledge about the aquifers as it applies to irrigation. And center pivot irrigation needs a big diameter well and uses a lot of water. Uh, the irrigation for smallholders can start with shoveling the, the, uh, you know, the soil if the water's near the, the surface. So it depends always on exactly what site you're working on. But, and there's a lot of expertise in, in the university. We have, I know of two professors, uh, Dwayne Hansen and Charlie Wortman, who are, have spent much of their life in Africa looking at groundwater and farming and issues like this but it's not widely spread. It's certainly not in the local population, and it's a tremendous deficit, and it's something that is known very well in Nebraska, at the university, but also in other universities across the country and probably in Europe. So there's a, I think there's untold opportunity for practical results. So you're saying I should restrain how enthusiastic I was about hearing that there's enough renewable groundwater in sub-Saharan Africa for a lot of irrigation. You're saying that maybe people don't know enough to actually say that. Probably. Uh, it depends on where you are. And um, I'm sure there is a lot um, in yeah. general. But mm -hmm. it depends on if you're building a farm or you own land, it depends on what's underneath you. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thought that uh, came to my mind, and I was very inspired by uh, Jeff Rake's uh, speech on being a catalytic partner and catalytic partnerships. But I was just thinking, if you compare the um, their first child immunization program compared to what we are dealing with on resource management and its relationship to productivity growth then the amount of information that one needs to make something transformational is completely different. You know, it's much easier to inoculate children and you have limited amount of information. You need to be very successful. But when it comes to sustainable productivity growth, it's a really big challenge. And I think what I heard here was that, I mean, I heard two kinds of messages. There is. Um, big data information overload in a way. There's lots and lots of information. And sometimes the farmers were saying there is information, but we don't really know what difference does it make when we change our practices to even our own outcomes. And certainly not when you take into account externalities of what others are doing, etc. So I think there is, there is this need for uh, information to be used at different scales from the farmer to the household to the community level to the basin level and then in case of the story on drought in in the u.s interstate level uh, and so i think if policy makers or those of us who are working on policy identified what the data needs are uh, and how this huge amount of data could be harnessed to address questions at different levels and whether there is any scope for 
bringing that together, I think there would be much more return to information, to convert information into knowledge and knowledge into policies and for change in policies and institutions. So, I would very much like to see some kind of a theory of change as I was mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, so, that how do we get from here all this information to how do we actually bring about change. Or how do we get from should, should, should into how you would do it. Yeah. Uh, Anne, do you want to talk about that? How do you get from, you know, you're running an alliance that's supposed to make people do things differently. How do you get from <coughs> we ought to, they should, to actually how you do it? And how do you get more attention focused on that? And has this conference done it? I think this conference <coughs> has been really great at sharing a lot of opportunities and examples of what has worked and what hasn't worked. One example that we have here that uh, Mike Weller mentioned during the industry panel, and I don't know if Mike's still here, is the Alliance for Advanced Food Sanitation. That uh, was just announced officially last fall, and it will be housed here at the Food Innovation Center. And this is an idea that actually was brought up by two faculty members um, over in the Food Science and Technology Department. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of work, obviously, with people in the food processing world, many companies. And through their work, they came up with, they identified a gap. How do we make food processing uh, more efficient? How do we uh, lessen the amount of time needed when they do sanitation around food processing, more specifically to the sanitation? How do we make it so they don't have to stop their line one shift a day and take everything apart and clean it? How do we make it so they can use less chemicals? And in regards to this conference, how can we make that sanitation process so it uses less water? And how it was done was through a lot of work and a lot of trust building and a lot of communication. And so um, a small group here within the university worked with a small group of private industry partners who ended up being our founding partners. Mm -hmm. And it, it took quite a long time. It took a year and a half from that first discussion to saying, what would this look like? How can we work together in a pre-competitive basis to have an impact on food sanitation that will result in those outputs that really can make a transformative change, which is what Jeff Rakes talked about in the sanitation world around food processing. And so it, it took a lot of time. We have eight founding members, um, Mike, who presented at the industry panels from Ecolab. We have others that are joining uh, the alliance who have joined. Nestle, Kellogg, Hershey, ConAgra, Cargill, those colleagues as well. And we're all working together to see if we can have an impact. Do the research and validate that research that uh, results in a change in policy. So that's one small way and one small example, I think, that will have Good. a huge impact. Cool. I was very impressed with the food processing panel that was talking about how you actually uh, move to to meet regulatory standards and to improve the profitability of food manufacturers. Well, uh, well, you know. And anyway, I was very, very impressed. And they certainly moved from the should, should, should to the how you get it done. Very meticulous. And the poster winner uh, that we all applauded for at lunch uh, was one of the the main presenters at this. And uh, Yulia. Anyway, Peter. I was at the food processing uh, s s seminar also. I just wish that we were three people, we could go to each of the sessions at the same time. Cloning, cloning. <laughs> so it was really tough to follow, but I thought that the, uh, the food processing was, uh, they talked about the footprint basically, but the footprint with some real meat on the bones. And it was nice to see you know, the details of uh, the tomato paste production. I mean, I, I, know I, don't, I eat tomato paste to my pasta, but to see what goes into it and the technologies and the, the options that you have in terms of ch saving water, saving energy, improving the product, producing byproducts from the thing. That, that was a wonderful example of a couple of other examples in that same panel. But I think that the data, the big data issue, that's, that's like a small data issue. That's, you look at an industry and you look at the flow charts and, and work it out by, step by step. The other type of data is the data on things like trading of water, trading of commodities, uh, trading commodities for water or however you do that. That's a much different type of data sets and you can't, that's not big data, that's data that requires observations, patient observations by social scientists, uh, agronomists. Uh, 
and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And entrepreneurs, yes, in, uh, as well. In, uh, so I think we don't want to get carried away too much by the big observational data sets we can get, which I think, by the way, it just blew my mind when I saw some of these presentations. I think they're, they're fantastic. But there are other things to worry about, too. And I think small data has a role to play in that thing, which requires, may require a lot more thinking through than some of the big data. Okay, thank you. You know, when you sit at a conference like this, you become really convinced that the world, the agricultural world, is taking account of the actual situation of water, and you get very buoyed up to feel that, uh, yes, yes, the world, the world is starting to take account of the situation with water, the fact that we can't go on with the same patterns we've gone on with in many places, that there's a quality as well as a quantity issue. Um, I want to know, is this undue optimism, uh, Uma? I mean, is what we heard here uh, in the examples, rather than the people here who we presume feel that way and are very concerned about the situation of water in agriculture, but did you get the feeling from the world that is being described by our very talented panelists and presenters that this awareness is growing and that there is a willingness and openness to start taking more measures to do something about water use in agriculture? You know, I certainly hear a lot of uh, rhetorical um, um, emphasis on how important water is. But if I look at, um, is there enough emphasis on what it takes to increase water use efficiency in agriculture and what the options are? Uh, I'm very impressed by what I've seen about Nebraska, for instance, and I've said several times that there are probably a lot of lessons to be learned from Nebraska. Uh, I am less uh, impressed by the interstate situation in the US and what lessons are to be learned. Uh, they are much more complex, of course. But um, I, I don't, I, I think the problem of water management in terms of increasing efficiency is so complex once you move from the level of the farmer to the level even of the watershed, et cetera, uh, that I'm not sure that policymakers have given enough thought to what the data requirements are. I think you made the point about groundwater. I hear two different points of view in India, for instance, about how do we know about groundwater uh, levels, what will it take to know more about it, what implications it has for policy making in different states because the, they may, it may even have to be uh, lead to a shift in production from one part of India to another, etc. So it raises very grand issues in using water efficiently at different levels. And uh, similarly, I think the very strong interaction between uh, groundwater and irrigation in countries like Morocco, uh, where droughts make a huge difference, not just to rain-fed rain agriculture, but to irrigated agriculture. And so we just need to know so much more uh, uh, in terms of data which are relevant for policy making at different levels. And I'm not sure yet that we have that in developing countries to, to a level that one sees in a place like Nebraska, not to mention the political will and the institutional sophistication, the willingness to, uh, to tax uh, farmers to be able to manage water. I mean, you know, you look at many developing countries and it's all subsidies, subsidies, subsidies to everything. Where do you see uh, water charges or even willingness to well, pay for anything? See the opposite. Uh, yeah, exactly. In the Saudi opposite. Arabia yesterday, the Minister of Water and Energy was fired by the king because he <laughs> cut the subsidies, trying to cut the subsidies on water. Yeah. And the, you know, everybody you talk to in the Arab world, of course, the, the intellectuals and the academics and the managers all think that raising the price of water would be a good idea, or at least get rid of the subsidies. But this was a young progressive minister in Saudi Arabia, and he was cut off yesterday and fi fired. And so the message isn't, isn't going out in the way it should do. That we're, we're still thinking we can subsidize our way out of these problems. You know, one of the recommendations of the G20 report uh, to the G20 governments is that they should use 
much more experience from developed uh, from all countries where things are working and share that experience to see what are its implications for policy reforms within G20 countries. And if that uh, recommendation was ever followed, we would learn so much from what uh, the US is doing, what Australia is doing, and what its implications are for mm. policies in developing countries and vice versa. I think there are other things that developing countries are doing which will work better. Do you see optimism and do you think the world is waking up to, I mean, your world is waking up to the fact that you can improve water efficiency, but what about the need to change water habits and water policies? Well, I, it's good to start with a good example. The U.S., I think as a country, not just Nebraska, but as a country has, I think our peak water withdrawals for irrigation were back in the 80s. And now we use, we remove less water for irrigation and from uh, groundwater and surface water, and yet we produce much more food. So we've done a good job. If you look at it globally, mm -hmm. I'm sure there, everybody has their horror stories, but um, it's, a, it's a complicated story, and there's probably lessons for everybody in different parts you know, that are similar. And um, we, the panel this morning, I just thought, was a perfect example of a, a businessman, a, a farmer, and a regulator uh, talking about problems, and you could see the, the behavior was quite civil. It was, they were, of course, on their best behavior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you go back to, when I first came to Nebraska in the mid-90s, it was not quite as civil as that. It was uh, a little bit, and, and they were hit with uh, regulations and laws. It was like bucket of cold water after bucket of cold water, because the state, uh, uh, the unicameral is our governing body, and it, it's also a blunt instrument, I think, uh, sometimes when it comes to water policy. So they had to deal with all that, and they did it mainly by solving problems locally and talking them through and coming up with practical solutions and protecting their economy. So, you know, this is a state that hardly has a recession when the rest of the country has a recession. And I think it's because of finding these solutions. So. Well, it's certainly one of the stellar examples of changed water management. Uh, but I listened to Ken say that, was it 15 percent? There's 15 percent metering in uh, uh, water meter use in farmers. Where was that? Uh... In, in Nebraska, in, in many NRDs, they require water meters on, in Nebraska. In, in Nebraska, in many natural resource districts, the, the managers of those districts, which are citizens elected by their neighbors, require high quality water meters on all irrigation wells. But one of your panels said that what the, because um, I wrote it down, the number of metered farmers was only 10 to 15 percent. Now I don't know what that, uh, that figure was about. Does anybody take ownership of that figure? <laughs> oh, that was soil moisture meters. Okay, good enough. Good, because my favorite quote of the conference was from John in the, pan the first panel this morning, John Bergen. He says, if you know how much your water you're using, you're going to cut it back by at least 15%. So, uh, right. By the way, I agree with you on USA water usage. It gives me great pleasure to tell Canadians that the per capita usage of water in the United States is lower than Canada, it has been going down, and continues to go down, and Canadian levels do not. So since Canadians think that they have an angelic streak, it's rather nice to... <laughs> well, you, have the, you have the polar ice cap. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anne, would you like to comment on whether we're actually starting to change uh, as a result of uh, real pressures on water. Is there evidence of change that you can see? I think there are. I think the NRD example certainly is a good one. Uh, the NRD, I believe, started in the early 1970s mm -hmm. here in Nebraska. And so, you know, it's, it was really ahead of the curve. And now we can see the positive outcome you can have when you're ahead of the curve. So I think our <laughs> challenge is to think, you know, we're all working very hard on things right now, but let's think ahead. In 50 years, while we're doing what we're doing now, what are the big gaps, what are the big transformative ideas we need to address that will be affecting our children or our grandchildren in the next 50 or 100 years? I can't imagine our grandparents ever considered there'd be metered anything. So, you know, life changes, and how are we gonna prepare for that change moving forward? How do I, we identify what we need to innovate towards? 
Peter, you gave a pretty depressing example of the Saudi Arabian minister getting fired. Uh, have you got any good examples of water good, behavior good change? <laughs> good example. Um, at Harvard, we have a $20 million fund at the business school for the maintaining the lawns. So the irrigating, the only irrigation we do is ir irrigate lawns in our, our part of the world. <laughs> but um, in the good example is uh, the Boston Metropolitan Water District which uh, was actually in serious water con conditions in 1986. They were using 300 million gallons of water per day in Boston. And the safe yield of the reservoir was 290. So there we have, we, live, we, we have. were living beyond our means. And the pl plans were made to build a new, a new reservoir. And of course, what happened was at the same time, we suddenly discovered we had to do something about treating our wastewater and because we were from Boston, we, we were delinquent, we didn't get the federal government to pay 75% of it. We ended up paying it 100% for ourselves, which meant that this had to be paid for on the water bills. And the water bill went up from $110 a year in 1986 to $1,000 a year for a household in, in 1999. And what happened to the demand for water? exactly what you, we predicted. It would drop to less than 200 million gallons a day. In fact, now the, the water authority is faced with the fact that they've over-conserved water. They have this huge reservoir and the, 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 the price of water is high, so people are using less and less. So they want to figure out how to get people to use more water, which is a, a, <laughs> a, a short period of time. It's a nice problem to have unless you've got all those bonds that you have to retire, but right. certainly that's a good example on the other side now. That's, okay. that's irrigation of the small areas of green grass yes. uh, that we have. Good. Well, listen, I'm going to give everybody one minute uh, as our panel ends, because they only gave us 45 minutes to summarize this whole rich two days. Dreadful, dreadful. Uh, but I'm going to give each of the panelists one minute to say what you hope the take-home message will be uh, to yourself, to the group here. Uh, what's the take-home message, Ann, that you'd like to see leave this conference from this rich array of presentations? I think I have two points. Number one is an integrated approach is the only way for success. And I take that away just from the example of you can provide irrigation to areas, but if it's against their culture or they don't understand that it's okay to use it, what really have you accomplished? So really looking at the broad picture and the second thing is youth, youth, youth. They're not only our future for vision, they're our future to implement. Um, and so I just can't emphasize enough how important that is. Peter? <clears throat> well, I think that I would agree with Anne that the, the big picture was very positive here. I think that I certainly came, come away with a sense that if we could only expand this a little bit more to other parts of the world, and if people started listening to the messages here, that this would be a big step forward and I think the, 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 uh, the cooperation between the Food Institute and uh, other countries and other institutes in those countries and FA, the FAO and the UN agencies plus the universities and bringing students in on an interim basis and things like that. All of those are very positive type of things which are a big, big picture. I think on the smaller picture I was very pleased to see that the, there's much more in, involvement of social scientists than I, there were mm -hmm. five years ago, six years ago at our first conference. And that uh, things like water trading and the corporations that are specializing in doing this, reaching out to farmers to see that what they can do to help trade. Um, the, um, the, 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 some of the things, one of them was a, a, an undergraduate actually who was doing a project and I was when I was going through the hallways here, looking at the posters, I, I remember asking one of the students, was, was this his master's or his PhD thesis? And he said, no, I'm an undergraduate. And that's quite a surprise to me, uh, coming from where we are. Uh, that's a, a tremendous step, a lot of confidence on the part of the students in dealing with these bigger issues. And things. So I think that's a very positive take home for me. Very good. And your take home message to the audience? Oh, I was thinking, uh, I was going to ask um, <laughs> Uma. Okay. Uma. Uma. We'll ask Uma. What's oh, okay. I, I think, uh, you know, if you take the motto that what you 
uh, you can't manage what you ma uh, you can't measure. I heard a lot about what is being measured in the U.S. Uh, and I also heard a lot about what is now possible because of smartphones in what you can measure in Africa. For instance, I think these numbers that uh, investment in sanitation has increased, but the people who are using uh, toilets hasn't not only not increased, it's gone up. So it tells you a lot about how SDGs should not be monitored and how they should be monitored by measuring the right kinds of things. So. I would really urge that there be more comparative work so that one is comparing, say, Nebraska's experience on water management with uh, a few states in India uh, or China uh, comparatively, very strictly comparatively. So it's also multidisciplinary and one identifies what are the political and institutional preconditions that are necessary in order for things to happen. So it's not just technology, not just information technology, et cetera, but the much more of a holistic view. And I think there is uh, fantastic stuff going on on partnerships with uh, developing countries. I was very impressed by this partnership with uh, India, for instance, on groundwater management uh, in Ethiopia. and So there is a lot of scope to do comparative work and use students and faculty to do it in a multidisciplinary, multi-temporal, multi-level way by which one can learn a lot from this experience from Nebraska. So your, your take home message is, yes, find out what's going on here, but then make sure you compare it with something somewhere else to yeah, see if in you a, can in gain way strength. Which is, which one can relate to, and mm -hmm. it's the only way you can relate to it is by having comparative uh, stuff, comparative okay. studies. There you've got that message. What's your take home injunction? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that there's so much going on in the technical and high tech area and data management and analytics that I didn't know about, and it lends itself to partnership. It lends itself to universities and uh, mm -hmm. student projects and professor projects and partnerships between universities. And I just have, a, it's funny, we're in the midst of an ag downturn. We're at the depth of an ag downturn, but there's an optimistic spirit among everybody. I didn't really hear very much pessimism. I know I, Uma's point about that we have challenges around the world and we, the solutions we have all, in our hands are not necessarily what will get it done. But um, I have a lot of optimism about what can be done. My take home message is this is a marvelous place to have a conference, that the Doherty <laughs> Center is a great conference organizer, that we should all be very grateful for them. And I'm also very grateful to a good audience that is still here on the third day of the conference and all awake. And we thank you very much. And thank the panel, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>